prepared to dress for this evening. <laughs> I've never done an audience with John Hyatt before. So I'm sort of constantly I'm halfway between doing a concert, a gig, and halfway between a lecture. So it's a bit of I don't know what it is, I've only seen the ones with Ken Dodd <laughs> and uh, Charles Haltry. And uh, who's it all? Bob Monkhouse. Was he so, on the tally? Yeah. He used to be on fake, right? He was an, yeah. an audience with it. Anyway, so I've brought the guitar in case we want some music. And um, the other problem, having never done one before, was actually knowing how to speak or what to say. And it suggests an audience with. It, it would be, I'd be more comfortable with a conversation with, if you see what I mean, so we could just talk. But I feel like I've got to do some sort of preamble or presentation, but feel free as you did Liz, feel free to, to chip in with anything. Um, but maybe I should just set the scene really with a, a tiny bit of um, bit of history or non-history or contentious history or pseudo-history um, about Betty Treacle who's here with me tonight. In fact with me and the guitar it's a bit like uh, it's a bit like having a band, really. It's a bit like Wilson, Keppel and Betty. And uh, maybe I'll do the sand dance later. And then when people say, what's an audience with? I say, oh, you have to do a sand dance. I was first... I first came across Betty Treacle in the museum. She, she normally sits in the room through there on the wall. Um, back in 2002, when I worked at the university in the uh, fine art department, I was head of fine arts. And we had a research fellow called John Leslie who asked each member of the painting staff to select a painting from anywhere in the world that interested them. And he was a professional curator and he would go and get that painting and he would bring it to the gallery at the university and then each member of staff had to write um, a paragraph about why they were interested in the painting. So people went overboard, you know, they're asking for Goyers and Turners and Sickert and real high, high level paintings. And he actually went and got them for people and it was a nice interesting show and everybody wrote a paragraph. So I chose this painting because it's, it sort of haunts me in a way. Um, it's a painting of an unknown woman, Betty Treacle, by an unknown artist. And the only thing that's known about Betty Treacle is that the label that's in there that says she's got um, she's got a hooked nose and domino teeth and was a half wit and she wandered round Goodshaw Village and the the landscape round here carrying her house key, a large iron key in her hand, and never letting go of it. And that, that story came from um, a book by somebody called Mather, who, was, uh, who worked in St. Mary's Chambers when it was a church. So he was, he was um, part of the local um, religious hierarchy, if you like. And he wrote a book called Rambles Round Rossendale. Um, and in Rambles Round Rossendale, Rossendale had... When you walked around Rossendale with, in Mather's book, like other travelogues of the time, you also walked around the Greek mythological landscape. He, Greek myths were behind every bush um, and gods were, were, were there next to streams, there were nymphs and it wasn't just the local landscape, it was, it was him showing his, his intelligence if you like, his ability to, to give classical illusions. So a bit like the build in St Mary's Chambers if you've seen it next to the roundabout with its classical pillars, the book very similar to that, it was like the, the it was like the locality wanted to be classical Greece. Now I tried to find out who Betty was, and at the time I was trying to give Betty her honour back, because it just to be just represented as a half wit in the local museum seemed um, as though maybe she was being a disservice, being done a disservice, and. It seemed only fair when I started to write my paragraph 
to, to try and find out, during the month that the exhibition was on, to try and find out actually who Betty was and maybe who the artist was. So I went into the local library and the parish records and consulted with local historians who are fantastic. I mean, there's a real um, coterie of people who are experts on the region. So I didn't try and reinvent the wheel. I went to people who have actually done years of work on it. And I, I always said I would credit them, and I'm doing it now. Um, but nobody really knew who Betty Treacle was. And one of the problems is that Treacle is a by name. It's a nickname. Nobody had, because everybody had the same surname, because everybody was called Hoyle or Hargreaves, um, everybody had to have a nickname, which was usually um, designated by the job they did or the things they did in, in the society. So Betty obviously had a different <coughs> surname in real life, and Treacle was a nickname. So it's no good looking in the parish records because the nicknames aren't, or the by names as they're called, just aren't recorded. So. I then had to sort of ask what the possibilities were for Betty and the possibilities around treacle, or well, treacle and molasses were actually um, quite a new thing in, in Britain because they were the result of the slave trade. So they were, they were, they were actually brought across the world. So she's actually got a global name in a sense. But it also, following Mather, the root of the word treacle goes back to the Greek triacle which means antidote, or medicine, or cure. So possibly she made cures, as a lot of women did in those days, from local plants and local herbs. So maybe she was somebody who um, created potions. But the, it's known, in the history, it's known that there was somebody called Terrible by name. I'd hate to have it myself. His name was Slavering Dick of Love Club. And his wife, God knows, I don't know how he got his name, but his wife, <laughs> his wife was known for making cures. And there weren't usually um, that many people who did the same thing in a village. It was an interesting village. I've painted some of the villages out here. These are the paintings out in the corridor here, are the paintings I did in 2003, when the museum asked me to do a better tree for exhibition here following all this stuff I'd found out about Betty Treacle, because my paragraph turned into 40 pages that covered the whole wall of the exhibition. And in those 40 pages, I still didn't really find out who she was. But I found out a lot about the village of Goodshaw, which is up by Crawshaw Booth, up the road here. And Goodshaw is a very small place. It's got a big chapel. Um, there were a lot of Baptists there. There was, a, um, there was a village philosopher. One of the things that quotes about Betty was that she knew as much about the village goings on as did the village philosopher. So there's this, all of a sudden I've got this polarity in the village that a small place like that had not only got a philosopher but it also got a halfwit at the other end of the spectrum who knew as much about what was going on as the philosopher. And then there's Dr. Kerr there, who lived in the mansion house, who was an etymologist, and he looked at the roots of words. And the root of the word goodshaw, and Dr. Kerr wrote about it, is um, God is ha, which is God's wood, which is usually the sort of name that's given to a, um, a sacred clearing in a wood. So perhaps before it was a village, there was... Um, a, a ring of stones there, or a clearing in the wood, because a lot of the places around here are named after places with stone circles, like Accrington. The ring in Accrington means there was a stone circle there, and a lot of places like that, and a lot of places like um, on the other side of Manchester too, there's a lot of ring places. So that was what Dr. Kerr contributed to the story, and then there was Miss Gill, who was um, a spinster, um, but in the parish, um, she actually owned this painting. So the woman in the, in the painting out there was actually recorded as owning this painting, and her uncle was an artist. So and she lived in the mansion house, so she was quite well to do. So maybe her uncle painted this picture. 
But also, what I found out was that there were travelling artists at that time. And artists would go from village to village, from town to town, and from stately home to stately home, offering for a small amount of money to paint the prized pig or the cow or the, the thoroughbred horses or the servants. And there was a tradition of painting servants, so maybe Betty was a servant at the mansion house if Miss Gill owned the picture. Then I, did, I found out that there was a potential. I had this theory that the key maybe wasn't a sign of her stupidity, that she, it wasn't a sign of her a mental deficiency that she wandered around carrying a key. But she was painted with a key because the key was a badge of her office. So the key itself was a, a sign of what she did in Goodshaw. So I did some investigations in the parish record looking for Betty's because Betty wasn't a short word for Elizabeth in those days. Betty was a standalone name itself. So it's not a shortening of Elizabeth. So in the parish records you could find Betty. So I went through, painstakingly went through all the parish records looking for Betty's and looking for possibilities of Betty. And one Betty, and it was a hunch, and doing this sort of work is full of taking hunches. One Betty was called Betty Sanderson. And she was married to uh, Mr. Sanderson, who was the warder of Goodshaw Chapel. Now Goodshaw Chapel had two warders, and one looked after the people of the of the um, parish and the other looked after the building so maybe the key maybe she was the caretaker the person who, the janitor of Goodshaw Chapel so maybe she looked after Goodshaw Chapel and following this hunch I'd searched for Sandersons who were living in the area and following that this was getting towards the end of the month I actually found a live, living Betty Treacle. I found a living Betty Sanderson and I rang her up, got the number, and rang her up and spoke to her. And she was indeed the descendant of Betty Treacle. But I found out that Betty, unfortunately, um, was not loved by the descendant. Precisely because she was in this museum and called a halfwit. So the family were embarrassed by the fact that the only representative of their family was on show in a local museum as a halfwit. And Betty, the, the live Betty Sanderson's sister, was the person who in 1965 came into the gallery and pushed a biro a big biro through Betty's eyes and ripped the painting there. And she did that in the hope that the museum would take it out of display and that the, the family name would no longer be slandered by this painting being on show. And then interestingly, I borrowed this painting for the art school. It was on the wall in the art school. I then found out that the painting had been sent in 1965 by this museum to the art school and it was the art school who had mended it. And that wasn't that a, just a beautiful sort of circular thing. So the art school mended those. So it was, uh, it was with some historical um, irony really that when we were bringing the paintings to the exhibition, two of the paintings in the van, in sorry, Emrys, <laughs> in Emrys's van, were ripped. So, if you look at the painting of Betty Treacle, the big painting of Betty Treacle that I did, where she's looking over her shoulder back at you, and you look at the sky, there's an enormous rip in the painting. And so, I don't didn't mind because it's sort of poetic that Betty, it's in the tradition of Betty paintings that paintings should be ripped. Unfortunately, the other one that was ripped was this panorama landscape here, which has little to do with Betty. So, you, you get, in the tradition of the art school, I mended my own. So, um, if, you, if you want a bit of detective work, you can look for, uh, look for the rip in the paintings. So, that was back in 2002, back in 2003. 
The other thing that I found out um, was the remarkable history of music around here. Um, and the rise of music around here was the result of um, the Baptists and also the result of um, the institution of Sunday schools because there, were no, there weren't any schools for the poor at that time around here. And so with the growing wealth of the Industrial Revolution, um, there was set up a series of Sunday schools which counted music as one of the most important things. One of the most important ways for the illiterate and uneducated, people who couldn't read or write, to get in touch with the Bible. So a lot of hymns that we sing in our daily, uh, that we've sung through our years at school in assembly, were actually written in this area. And there was, there was even, um, which was one of my false trails, there was a, um, a hymn writer called Sanderson which would have been nice. If, and actually Sanderson wrote um, the American National Anthem. That Sanderson, not potentially, not the Betty, husband Sanderson. <coughs> so Hail to the Chief, is that the National Anthem? Is that what it's called? That's what he wrote anyway. Um, I was thinking very land of the bold. That's the same song, isn't it? That Hail to the Chief was written by Sanderson from around here. So one of the things I realised was that round here wasn't quite the back of nowhere. It wasn't quite the sticks that when I started the research, I sort of felt it was, you know, because I thought I was just thinking about a little village in the, the back end of nowhere. But that little village, even locally, was a busy place. That little village connected um, the cattle trail between Burnley and Blackburn. So all the drovers drove their cattle this way. And there were two pubs in the village where people used to stop and you could get um, a mess of broth, it was called, for um, Haveney. So you could stop there and have some broth. Or, and there were also wells in the village. There were a lot of village stories around wells and ghosts that were in the wells and apparitions that were seen in the wells. So there, there are a lot of stories about water and there are a lot of stories about um, trade. So what I realised with Betty and her name, Treacle and the slave trade, and going round, before I realised her name, Treacle was a by name, before I realised it was a nickname, I actually went around all the tombstones in the graveyard at Goodshaw. Um, <coughs> in the early evening, on a foggy early evening with the black cat for company. Um, it, was, it was quite atmospheric with the, the fog rolling in off the, off the tops. Um, but of course I didn't find the, the grave for Betty Treacle because that wasn't a name. But I did find a lot of graves that said simply, quite young people, that said simply, killed at sea, returning from the new world. So what you realise then was that the people from here the, the people that believed in music, the people that believed in trade, and the people that were living through the Industrial Revolution were actually living at the centre of the world at that time. People from here, the people that were um, non-conformists, were travelling to, fo to, fa to found a new world in America. It wasn't just a sort of provincial little place. And that the Industrial Revolution that grew up here, where you can, you can look at the things in the museum collection, the Industrial Revolution was something that is still now rolling on. Recently I went to China to, do, um, to select work to curate an exhibition of contemporary Chinese art from Chinese artists about their experiences of the Industrial Revolution in the last 30 years in China. So what started here at that time is still rolling around the world. I went to India, I went to Ahmedabad in India, I went to Gandhi's ashram there. Gandhi came here in 1938. I went to Gandhi's ashram and over the road there's a paper mill. And the first thing you see when you walk into the paper mill is a big machine that's got Manchester embossed in it. So all around the world people knew about this area. So, interestingly, it, it was 
a hot place. It was a happening place. And Betty, a, a sort of slight itch I had about finding out who Betty was and restoring her um, dignity to her, actually became a sort of global investigation all of a sudden. And the fact that Bet I was interested in Betty because she was sitting amongst the great big portraits of the local bourgeoisie actually led me to an investigation of the Industrial Revolution and how, it, how it's um, changed the world. And it changed the world in quite interesting ways. It changed the world in terms of speed. Everything's faster following the Industrial Revolution. It changed the world in terms of going amongst strangers. When you go to a city, you're not in the same atmosphere where everybody has their local nickname, where the baker is called Lolly Flower Cake. The, um, the person, there's, there's a person called Old Tackleton Mash. Betty's own daughter was called Old Melody, and she was a musician, she played the violin. So it's not, no longer where you know everybody and you know them by their nickname. In the cities you're going amongst strangers and you're going amongst shock, really. And clothing starting to be mass produced. And so everybody in the city was wearing very similar clothes. So you had to learn how to read little signs to see whether somebody was honest or a con man. It was actually the rise of the con man. And you got um, that fantastic novel, I don't know whether you've read it by... Herman Melville called The Confidence Man, which is about the rise of con and tricksters. So the whole world was changing very rapidly. And maybe Betty was sighted at the very moment of that change. And maybe this little unknown painting in what was in 2003 a museum that should have been in a museum. It wasn't like it was now. These walls were Hessian and, um, and form. It was, it was, and everything was covered in dust. And um, the staff, God love them, because they were very kind. But they were, it had a hint of the um, League of Gentlemen about it. Let's say that. Um, and there's no, you couldn't get a cafe in a place like it was back in, the, in those days. And it was, it was, the main feature was the shrunken head, the gizmo for the town gossip to stop them talking, um, the lion, the stuffed lion being strangled by, if you look at it, two stuffed snakes stuck together. It's a, it was a museum of curios. Um, so, when recently Jackie, Julian and Carl, the, the triacle um, of this museum, if you like, the threesome that have, um, are trying to make a go of this museum, asked me if I would do a Betty Treacle exhibition. I said yes immediately because I realised that they're trying to do something here for the community and trying to make the collection more accessible for the school kids and for the public. Whereas back then, if you came in the museum, it was, like, it was very much like the local shop, you know. We'll have no trouble here. We don't really want um, people in. So, I said yes immediately, but they asked me, and Jackie will corroborate this, they asked me in December, and I said yes, that'd be great. And she said, can we open on the 31st of January? And I went, ooh, because I, I said yes, instantaneously. Um, and then I realised that's only like a month away. And a lot of my paintings are on tour elsewhere. There's some in Brazil and there's some in Munich. And so I had to think how I could construct an exhibition around Betty Treacle. And in a sense I was putting an exhibition together from the paintings I had left if you like, from my Betty Treacle paintings, the paintings that I wouldn't be, the, they wouldn't be the first ones for me to show. And that's worked out, I think, quite fortuitously and quite interestingly. And it's actually made me re-evaluate this work and look at it again because 
It was the work that I, I did in my quieter, non-intellectual moments, if you like. It, it's the work that I did um, to relax, or the work that I did without thinking too much. It was the work that was just to, to enjoy the act of painting. And when I came to do the Betty Treacle exhibition, doing this exhibition has made me re-evaluate my attitude to Betty. Because what I was trying to do before was to give Betty her, her honour back by giving her back a status in society where she didn't, she wasn't just an idiot or a half -wit. But what I've realised is that maybe Treacle, as you would initially expect, comes from the idea of slowness, moving slowly. You get it used now in Cockney rhyming slang, you say, come on Treacle, and it means you're slow, you know. Maybe to give Betty her respect back, to give her dignity back, I should acknowledge the fact that perhaps she wasn't in need of me intellectualising her. She wasn't in need of cleverness. She was just in need of somebody loving her for who she was. Because certainly the artist that painted this picture didn't love her. In fact, the, the records say that he bribed her to sit for the painting with a handful of wood chips, suggesting that she was stupid enough to do that. But maybe Betty's slowness is actually the pace that I need to slow my city intellectualised life down to in order to understand the local landscape and the local natural environment. To understand the environment as it was before we filled it full of mills. And maybe we're coming now out of that industrial revolution period. Maybe we're coming out of the era that unfortunately the Chinese are experiencing. Because if you go to Beijing, it's terrible. If you go to Beijing, if you, if you find a tree, it'll be behind a fence and it'll be a lone tree. Beijing is full of dust, it's full of skyscrapers going up by the dozen, it's full of people coughing, it's full of people um, getting fatter and fatter because their diet is changing from their old diet, which was fairly vegetarian and rice based, to what they see as a better diet, which is a western diet, which is meat based. And they're gradually eating more at McDonald's and Kentucky Fried Chicken who are over there, franchised over there. And the, the Chinese are gradually getting fatter and fatter, they've got an obese, a real obesity problem over there. But maybe, thankfully, maybe we're coming out of that period of history. The period of history where we treated the natural world with disdain and we used the natural world for its resources without thinking about being caretakers or janitors, without being caring for how we use the natural world, for taking without thinking, if you like. Maybe we've been living through 150 <coughs> years of taking without thinking. And perhaps the terrible um, floods we've been experiencing are because of that disdain that we've had for the natural world that we continually, like in this painting, are pumping stuff into the atmosphere, heating it up, heating it up, to the, to the point where, like when you heat up a boiled egg, it slow, the water slowly goes like this, and then starts to bubble from the bottom, and the egg starts to bounce. And then you reach a tipping point where the water undergoes a phase transition and very suddenly at the surface of the water switches with great violence, if you look at it, switches from a liquid state to a steam state. It undergoes a phase transition. 
It flips from one state of being to another state of being simply because we've added heat into the system of the boiling egg. And the egg itself switches from a liquid state to a solid state inside its egg casing. Now, we live in a world that is an egg, basically. We live in an atmosphere shell, in hold, held in space. And we've been heating up the environment, and in the 1990s I was doing lectures at universities saying, if we continue to heat up this environment, we won't notice for a while, then it will start to oscillate between extremes, and then it will flip over. We'll have a phase transition to a new environment. And that's perhaps what's starting to happen now. I think there's a general consensus that, that that's what's happening now. So burning old tyres on the hilltops and power stations in the background and the odd factory in the town in the middle distance is, and the pieces of underlay that I've stuck into the paint, carpet underlay, burning on this hillside fire. Maybe, the, maybe I'm not caring about these things. It has led us to the situation that we're in today. Now, I don't want to be doom and gloomy because it's not doom and gloom really because the planet will survive. The, planet will, the weather system will switch over to a new pattern and so we'll have things built in the wrong places like houses on the floodplain. But what we need to do, I think, as um, a human species is to withdraw gracefully to the higher ground and start to design thoughtfully how we're going to deal with the changes in the natural system. How we're going to deal with the fact that the coasts will be eroded and the waters will rise. And hopefully it's artists and designers in conversation with um, engineers that can help us get out of this problem. And so I think we've reached a historical moment where the separation between science and art has to end. The artists and the scientists need to talk to each other and work together with the planners, with the engineers, and from both our traditions come up with the answers for how we deal with these problems. So when science and art split, if you remember, if you go back to Leonardo's time, Leonardo was a scientist and an artist equally. He was an engineer as well. These things weren't split. But when we split off, or when science, if you like, grew from arts, when science became the child of art and wandered off, became the prodigal son that wandered off from the mother of art, Science lost its way in terms of it forgot about caring about the natural world. And for a period of years, a number of years, not all scientists obviously, but as a general sort of cartoon version of science, which is all I can talk about here, scientists forgot about our responsibility to simple things like Betty and the world that she lived in. Simple things like walking in a natural landscape and toning yourself down, calming yourself down, a bit like a meditation, taking yourself down, down, down into a state where you can feel something. When I paint these pictures I can feel a spirit in the natural world and that spirit is asking us to love it again. That spirit is palpable when I'm painting. Because painting is very like meditating. When painting is going really great for me, I lose myself in the act of painting. My ego, my edges, disappear. John Hyatt, the artist, John Hyatt, the professor, John Hyatt, the man, all these labels that go on the words John Hyatt, all the labels fall from me and I become 
one with the act of painting. And that's what I think artists and musicians call getting in the zone. You become the work itself. You become a recipient of a feedback loop between, through the paintbrush, through the eye, through the hand, with the work of art. And then, when you get into that stage, it starts to work. And when you get into that stage, that state, I think it must be very similar to a meditative state. Very similar to the things that the, the Chinese poo-pooed and lost during their communist phase. That they outlawed, in fact, they outlawed certain aspects of Buddhism, for example. And they embraced the scientific worldview and believed that new, new technologies that were dirty technologies um, would get them forward. They had the idea of going forward, unlike the older agrarian idea of a cycle of nature, that spring comes before summer, comes before autumn, comes before winter, then you go back to spring again, and it's a cyclic feeling rather than an arrow of progress that pushes forward through time and it's going to get better and better and better. I think the arrow of progress has snapped now and we need to look for a new metaphor for how we move forward. So in painting these pictures, in entering the meditative state, I'm also trying to find a way of speaking again about the natural world because these paintings these are not the sort of work that you see in contemporary art. These look like the sort of art that has been left behind by contemporary art. They look like the sort of art that you could get in local, you know, you get exhibitions of local artist paintings. There's a sort of um, type of painting that is poo pooed by the intellig intelligentsia, by the contemporary art world, by courses in places like the university where I work. And it would, it's a, actually extremely damaging, potentially, to my career as a um, quite well-known contemporary artist, to just simply exhibit nice landscapes. And it's also, I contest, a fairly radical thing to do. To return to this sort of work is actually, I would, I would claim, putting myself at the forefront of contemporary art, but it's a forefront that is a return. It's not an avant-garde that is pushing forward, forward, forward. It's not the modernist idea. It's not even the post-modernist idea, which I think is actually just modernism speeded up. You know, post-modernism is ultra-modernism. It's about going faster and faster and faster. But this doesn't mean... I didn't think I'd speak for this long. I was going to play a song at the beginning. I apologise. It doesn't mean that I'm a Luddite. It doesn't mean that I don't believe in technology. I do believe in new technology. And I think things like the computer and social media, things like Facebook, are influential in people coming back together in new communities and the new communities don't rely on you all living in the same place and having nicknames in the same place they actually rely on you creating communities of interest using things like Facebook so it's great for me that my friends, because I can see you from Facebook are here tonight because with Facebook we can create new communities of interest and people that will come together to actually become the caretakers of the future, I hope, rather than the um, ravages of the future. That's why we have to defend the internet against state intervention and against snooping and against censorship because it's the one medium we have now to talk globally with people of a like mind so that we can solve these global problems together, I think.
you like to sing a song? We won't stop talking, I'll take some questions. That was quite a rant, really, wasn't it? I want to play you a song because the acoustics in here are fantastic. It's just marvellous. And the, the museum, the Whitaker, are going to have acoustic evenings um, on the, when, the first Wednesday of every month. Next Wednesday. Next Wednesday. So I might come back and play some next Wednesday with friends. Alistair, are you going to play next Wednesday? Could do, could do. Yeah. So there's two. Oh. So in the tradition of Good Shaw, um, I still believe in music. Um, though you may not say it when you hear me. Um, but I think music is important because I'll talk about why it's important after I play this song. Yeah. I'm playing you a local song. This this song is about just being around here. So it's not a great rock song. It's more folk. Because... 